very much to see your landscape, and uh, it's quite like un quite unlike anything I've seen before. I've walked around, and I'm glad for the snow as opposed to the rain that I was told I'd find. And the sunny day yesterday was particularly thrilling. Um, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to play it pretty straight, is is um, go through some material dealing with the Indian peoples of Northern California. Uh, the work that when we have a tape, and I'm going to read something, and then I'm going to play a tape of an old Spaniard by the name of Jaime D'Angulo, who uh, effectively dropped out of white culture in about 1912 and lived with Indian peoples till he died in 1950. He initially went through some of this material as an anthropologist or even an amateur anthropologist. He never formally obtained an anthropological degree. Um, he wrote it down in a kind of way anthropologists write these things down and forgot about it for about 25 years. Then after that period of time where I think he felt finally sufficient to the story, felt that he was well grounded enough in the cultures that he was speaking through, uh, he went about the business of rewriting a lot of the material. He uh, died in 1950, was born in Paris, France in 1887. I guess the other significant date is that he came to the United States in 1906, worked as a uh, sheep herder, Colorado, Wyoming, prison guard in Guatemala. Then San Francisco, 1906, and with the exception of a few years away from the state, he would remain in San Francisco, Bay Area, Northern California, and New Mexico. He spent some time in the Southwest for the rest of his life. I'd like to read, um, we've done, I guess I should say something about the foundation. We're a nonprofit, uh, unendowed <laughs> uh, foundation for, uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, we, we're not working with government grants. We will if we could obtain them. We haven't been successful so far. Uh, we do all the work ourselves. Uh, we make the books. We pick the material. Many of the materials uh, of the books we've written have been written by friends. Uh, and then we go about working with other friends to make the books, to select the artwork, to print them, to bind them and then usually through the mails to send them out to other friends who share our enthusiasms. Um, my own feeling is that about this kind of nonprofit, individual, independent foundation is that we can't really, or we couldn't, we can't afford in California, Alaska may be very different, and everything I say must, I'm aware that I'm in a different region. Uh, we can't really depend on help from institutions or the federal government. Uh, and, any, and, and we don't want to if we can avoid it. We like the idea of being able to do and set the terms for our own work without apologies or the necessary but unhappy politics that usually goes into uh, working with such institutions. Okay, I'm going to read the introduction to the, the first of five books by Dean Gulo that, uh, that we did. Something I wrote, something I still feel. I just reread it over in the uh, hotel room and wrote this about three years ago and I was able to change a couple words but I still think it's uh, what I feel. Winter comes early to El Taurus. The snow begins to fall in early October and the long Arctic winters stay until the last days of March. The Pitt River Indians have lived on that barren, forbidding plateau in northeastern California for thousands of years. The snow people. That's what the Modoc call them. In the old days, with the first flakes of winter, the Indians would climb down through the smoke hole into the winter lodges. Inside the lodge, dug into the ground, the roof covered with earth, it was warm even with a small fire. Yet you have to be an Indian, Jaime D'Angulo writes, to stand the crowding, the lack of privacy, the eternal squabbling of babies. And after a few mon months of occupancy, the vermin was terrible. Once in a while, someone would take out the old litter and bring in a fresh supply of pine boughs. But the fleas, lice, cockroaches, and other bugs soon returned and made life once more a misery. People sighed for the coming of spring and quarreled as to what month they were in. The old chiefs were consulted, but they disagreed. And so winter passed. In those days, the Pitt River Indians didn't really have much of what we would call culture. Their baskets were second rate, the patterns too blurred, too crude. No skin painting, nothing at all unusual about their dress. 
Even their dancing was inferior, stiff, awkward, too rapid. Singing was about the only form of art developed by those Indians, the Angulo writes, singing and old time stories. Jaime D'Angulo bought a cattle ranch in Alturas in 1913. Dr. Jaime D'Angulo, the son of a Spanish Don, D'Angulo came to America at the age of 18 and worked his way out west as a cowboy, taking odd jobs on ranches in Wyoming and Colorado. He arrived in San Francisco just in time for the earthquake of 1906. In San Francisco, he began to study medicine at the former Cooper Medical College, Cooper then to John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, where he received his first medical degree in 1912. The next year, D'Angulo became a partner in the ranch and met the Pitt River people for the very first time. His introduction was cut short, however, by the outbreak of the First World War. D'Angulo volunteered for service, and before long, he was sent to Ann Arbor to attend an early course on psychiatry for Army doctors. He graduated, then stayed on as an instructor at the school for the remainder of the war. Back at the ranch, a few months later, D'Angolo decided to drive a herd of horses down from the plateau through the long 500-mile Central Valley to New Homestead land in the Big Sur. He was living on the new land in the summer of 1919 when two college professors, Alfred Krober and Paul Radin, rented a cabin nearby. During the next few months, the three men became close friends, and by the end of the summer, D'Angolo had accepted Krober's invitation to join him at the university the next year. So, in 1920, Jaime D'Angulo left cattle ranching for a while and taught his first two courses in Berkeley, one in Jungian psychiatry, the other on the mind of primitive man. D'Angulo helped inaugurate the golden age of American anthropology at Cal, and that's the University of California, Berkeley. Krober and Radin were already in residence when he arrived. Robert Lowy, Carl O. Sauer, and briefly, Edward Sapir would also join the staff by the end of the decade. Jaime D'Angulo's presence alone, one suspects, would have been enough. His wonderful ear for language quickened the environment. In the company of these men, he expanded his interests, 17 new languages, 17 new languages during the next 15 years. Chatino, Chichameco, Chichateco, Choco, Chanto, Mazateco, Mixe, Tequisletec, and Zapotec proper, the Indians of Mexico. Karak, Klamath, Modoc, Miwok, Paiute, Pomo, Shastan, and Achimawi the Indians of Northern California. He even managed to translate Lao Tzu with the help of only a small pocket dictionary. But D'Angulo began with Achimawi, the spoken language of his former Pitt River friends. In 1921, he returned once more to Alturas, this time to record the grammar and the literature of his chosen tribe. Real primitive people, he would write, not like those cultured Indians of the Southwest, Real Stone Age men, my Indians in overalls. Season after season, he camped with old Jack Folsom and Lena in the stage sagebrush on the plateau. His eye caught the detail of gambling gains and healing rites, and his ear, always his ear, picked up the short clipped cadences of the Pitt River tongue. He never lost his fascination with that language. In D'Angulo's later novels, David Olmsted writes, the Indians continue to speak in sentences which are undeniably and perfectly grammatical Achimawi. In winter camp, D'Angulo began to translate, translate the, the, the Lassaniki, the old time stories of the Pitt River people, the spirit history of the tribe. In the beginning was the word. The stories he felt dated back into the furthest reaches of the Stone Age were more ancient than myth. And the word was with God. In these stories, he felt he had found one of man's earliest attempts to make articulate the movement of the spirit. And the word was God. Quote, the symbolism in these stories is so crude and so little disguised that it can't really be considered symbolism at all. In this early stage of civilization, ideas are still imminent in objects and have not yet been separated, either through identification or projection. Speaking as a Jungian there. In these stories, we find the Tinahawi, the primitive religious spirit reflected throughout. And yet, the reader might ask, if the Pitt River Indians have no religious ceremonies, no priesthood, no ritual of any kind, and not the slightest approach to any conception of Godhead, how can one speak of their having any spiritual or religious values? I grant that it may sound paradoxical, but I must answer on the contrary. 
The life of these Indians is, is nothing but a continuous religious experience. The spirit of wonder, the recognition of life as power, as a mysterious, ubiquitous, concentrated form of non-material energy, of something loose about the world, and contained in a more or less condensed degree by every object. This is the credo of the Pitt River Indian. Of course, they would not put it precisely this way. The phraseology is mine, but it is not far from their own. Formed and transformed by a hundred Sierra Mountain homers, sung back and forth in these hills for thousands of years, the Dalasaniki were born that first morning. Dalasaniki, the origin. Dean Gulo left academic life in 1934. In the grasp of an endless series of personal tragedies, he turned more and more to poetry and literature. In the late 1940s, he began to rewrite his early Northern California Indian texts to the delight of his children. The project grew, and after considerable revision, out popped the book called Indian Tales. In 1949, he read the final text to an astonished audience over the radio station KPFA in Berkeley. A year later, he was dead. In later life, Dean Gulo had become something of a legend here in Northern California, or there in Northern California. Both a legend and a mystery. A tragic dark figure, some would say, the darkness of a North Coast Poe. No old friends replied. He was just wandering. I want to speak now, he wrote that first spring, of a certain curious phenomena found among the Pitt River Indians. The Indians refer to it in English as wandering. They say of a certain man, he is wandering, or he has started to wander. It would seem that under certain conditions of mental stress, an individual finds life in his accustomed surroundings impossible to bear. Such a man starts to wander. He goes about the country traveling aimlessly. He will stop here and there at the camps of friends or rel relations, moving on, never stopping at any place any longer than a few days. He will not make any outward show of grief, sorrow, or worry. In fact, he will speak of what is on his mind to no one, but anyone can see that he is not all right. He is morose, uncommunicative. Without any warning, he will get up and go. People will probably say of such a man, he has lost his shadow. He ought to get, a doc he ought to, get to a doctor to get it back for him before it is too late. The wanderer, man or woman, shuns camps and villages, remains in wild, lonely places, on tops of mountains, in the bottom of canyons. Whenever anyone approaches, he runs away, throws sticks and rocks at his friends and relatives. They will spy on him, waiting for his condition to improve. They find him performing antics of behavior, running and jumping, with shouts and songs, and breaking branches, hurling rocks at trees. Wandering is something that may unfortunately befall any man or woman, and it can take many, many forms. It may end up in a complete loss of soul and lingering death. When an Indian becomes convinced that he has lost his shadow, he will let himself die out of sheer hopelessness, Pitt River Indian. Or it may result in temporary madness. The Indian, Pitt River Indian, never courts pain. It would never enter his head to imagine that by making himself miserable and pitiful in the eyes of the powers, he might gain their sympathy and aid. This is not his conception at all. To him, the mysterious power, the Tinahawi, we might call them genie, are whimsical spirits living in the woods and entirely indifferent to the affairs of the Pitt River Valley. In order to gain their friendship, in order to approach them without scaring them away, it is necessary to become wild oneself. It is necessary to lose one's own humanhood and become as wild as possible, as crazy as possible. Haunt lonely, desolate places. Act like a madman. Throw rocks about. Yell and dance like a maniac. Run away when anyone comes. Climb awful mountains. Climb down the rim of crater lakes. Jump into the silent, cold water. Spend all night there. Of course one suffers cold and hunger in such an experience, but it is only a necessary and inevitable accompaniment of getting wild. When you have become quite wild, then perhaps some of the wild things will come to take a look at you, and one of them may perhaps take a fancy to you, 
not because you are suffering in cold, but simply because he happens to like your looks. When this happens, the wandering is over, and the Indian becomes a shaman. All men are wanderers, the old people say. At the end, Jaime D'Angulo was trying to get home. I also like to read, um, we have published, uh, there are nine volumes in the set. Three of them contain Jaime's uh, old time stories. The old time stories are not traditional old time stories. Uh, they contain, however, these stories. They're the story day by day life of the Indians that he lived with. And occasionally during the course of the day there would be storytelling and those are integrated into the text. Fortunately, um, that radio program I referred to survives and we have obtained uh, copies of, there were 94 20 minute programs. He read three times a week. And uh, although the, they're, they're owned now by the Pacifica Foundation in Los Angeles, but they certainly to this day don't know what they have. We were able to obtain copies of the, uh, uh, our own copies of the program, but they have yet to uh, remaster the tapes or any of the business of, of, of protecting them. And I, I worry that uh, the copies we have, uh, plus perhaps copies that the Ingulos family have, uh, well, they might be the only ones after a point. And indeed, ours are wearing down, as you will hear, after so much play. We, we obtained from the, these tapes two of the volumes that we have, we have just put in the press down in San Francisco, which will be out in, in, in the fall. Uh, before, I'd like to read you just the creation story from this book, and then we do have a tape, and you will hear Jaime D'Angulo telling these stories. Uh, I, I think you'll find his voice quite unlike anything you've ever heard. It might be difficult at first uh, because there are so many different accents going into it. He's, he's part Spanish and part Pitt River and part French and part English and part of everything I guess he ever came in contact with, and you're going to hear most of that in his voice. And uh, um, I'm still startled by it, and I've listened to it for three years. But first let me just read, because I don't have it on tape, the Pitt River very short version of the Pitt River creation myth. Fox was the only living man. There was no earth. The water was everywhere. What shall I do, Fox asked himself. He began to sing in order to find out. I would like to meet somebody, he sang to the sky. Then he met Coyote. I thought I was going to meet somebody, Fox said. Where are you going, Coyote asked. I've been wandering all over trying to find someone, Fox replied. I was worried there for a while. Well, it's better for two people to go together. That's what they always say. Okay, but what will we do? I don't know. I've got it. Let's try and make the world. And how are we going to do that? Coyote asked. Sing, said Fox. With his thoughts, Fox made a cloud of earth. Then he held it in the palm of his hand. And cloud in hand, he began to sing. They were singing and dancing and stomping around in the sky. After a while, Fox threw the cloud into space. Don't look, he said to Coyote. Close your eyes. When I say look, then open your eyes. Again, Fox started to sing. After a while, he turned to Coyote and said, Look, what do you see? I see something very small way over there, Coyote replied. OK, close your eyes. Once more, Fox began to sing. After a while, he said to Coyote, Look, what do you see? It's getting bigger, Coyote said. Fox and Coyote repeated this over and over, and each time the earth grew bigger and bigger. Finally, Fox said to Coyote, close your eyes, we're going to jump. So Fox and Coyote jumped down to earth. They began to stretch the earth on all sides with their paws. That's how they made the world. They made the mountains and the rivers and the bear and the puma, the cedar and the pine and everything that lives all around. They did it all this bit by bit. And when they had finished, Fox and Coyote decided to live in the same winter lodge. They were the best of friends. Okay, we'll go to that, some of the more recent material. I hope. They were all weaving tule mats that day, and the autumn sun was pleasant. Even old man Turtle had come over, and he was weaving away. Antelope was the best weaver, of course. Her mats were even, and no loose ends. Bears and grizzlies were put her off. Simus were not bad, but Oriol and Fox were only beginners. Oriol especially was very poor at it. Simus said, 
Life is surely pleasant here. Just think, up north in my country, the water is frozen, there is snow everywhere, and the people are already cooped up in the winter house. The Astui, say, said Oriol. That's right. You say it just like a wolf girl. Fox said, I can't say it too. Astui, Simu laughed. No, you said winter. Astui, not house. That's Astui. What do you do all winter long? Sleep, tell stories, gossip. Antelope said, I should think it would be a fine time to weave. But when we went through there this summer, I did not see any good baskets. No, we are no good at basket weaving. I don't know why. The gazelles to the west of us, on the other side of Mount Shasta, they are not good weavers either. But did you see these little baskets that the crane people make down the Klamath River? They wear them on their heads for hats. Yes, those are fine weaving with pretty designs. I don't know how to weave that way. Your baskets here are the best I've ever seen. Then Oriol said, what I like about weaving is making designs. See, I'm making a design in this mat. What is it? asked Fox. It's a hummingbird. Oh, I thought it was an elk. Oriol jumped over him and gave him a drubbing. She was tickling him in the armpits and he hated being tickled. He cried, no, no, quit. It's a hummingbird, it's a beautiful hummingbird. I even hear him singing. Antelope said, before you start making patterns and designs, you have to learn to weave straight. I know, said Oriole, but I get bored. Never mind, Oriole, said Simu. Who cares if you weave straight or not? Make the designs to please yourself. You see a hummingbird, and I see a hummingbird. And he makes me dream of our country up north. Oh, but a hummingbird in a clearing in the woods when you are lying on your back, that's a gorgeous sight. Oriole was sitting in his lap, and she put her arms around his neck and hugged him. Fox said, Simu, you say that Cocoon Man was the first person in the world, and he watched the cloud for a million years, and then one day, the cloud came near him, and he jumped on it, and that was the world. Then, a Nicodel appeared from somewhere, and fooled him several times. That's right, said Simu. A Nicodel said to him, I fooled you three times. You thought you had made this world, but it was I who put the idea into your head. But maybe he was lying, you know. I told you. Everybody lies sometimes. And Nicodel must have been like everybody else, boasting and lying just for fun. Oh, Kuksu does not lie for fun, said Fox hotly. He does not. Doesn't your story say that he poked Marumda in the ribs with his long pipe? Maybe Marumda was ticklish like you. Kuksu poked him in the ribs and winked. The story doesn't say he winked, does it, grandfather? I don't know, said Coyote, old man. No, no, I don't think the story says that. But Turtle Old Man was laughing. He said, I'm sure he winked. It was enough to make anyone wink. Why, Uncle? Oh, because Marumda seemed to be all puffed up about making the world, and his older bro brother, Kuksu, thought it was funny. Turtle Old Man was enjoying himself. 
His little eyes were all wrinkled up. He shook with laughter. He had a few teeth left yet. Bear grumbled. And you were Yomta. That's not the way Yomta should talk. The turtle old man didn't pay any attention to him. He took his stick and poked old man Coyote in the ribs, and they both laughed. Fox said, but anyway, what I am after is this. You said, after that the cocoon man went away, and nobody ever saw him again. Yep, just like your Kuksu. No, grandfather says that some people see the Kuksu sometimes in the woods, hiding behind a tree, or in the clouds, or sitting on a rock in a clearing. But he won't answer him, answer you if you talk to him. He just squints and smiles and goes away. Isn't that right, grandfather? Yes, that's right. And you will see him, too, if there is an initiation this winter. He'll come out of the woods, or out of the lake, and drive you boys into the ceremonial house where you'll be initiated. And that night he will come and dance for the people. Fox boy said, Oh, I hope there's going to be an initiation this year. But listen, Simmo. Here's what I mean. If the cocoon man went away and nobody ever saw him again, why is it that then that he shows up in the story of the fury of Rune Woman? Well, there are many cocoons in the world. He was the first cocoon, that's all. You are not the only fox in the world. There have been foxes after there have been foxes after the original silver fox. And there will always be coyotes forever, interrupted Coyote Old Man. And turtles, don't forget turtles, said Turtle Old Man. Fox said, but what about Cocoon's man's son, the white woodworm? Oriole said, oh, that's Sissy. Why do you call him a Sissy, Oriole? Well, he was a Sissy, a man without a spear. What good is a man without a spear? Don't you remember they took his spear away from him? I never could understand why Loon Woman wanted him so much. Simu said, because he was a good look, good looking, nice and clean, all white. Bah, I don't want a nice clean white boy. You give me the creeps. Look, I weaved another bird. What kind of bird is that? Guess, Fox yelled, it's a wildcat. Listen, are you looking for another tickling? It's a thunderbird. What's a thunderbird? Oh, I don't know, I just made it up. He's a bird who lives in the thunder. Antelope said, where did you hear that, girl? Oh, I just thought it up. The two old men were laughing. You'll soon hear the Halimatoto if there's going to be an initiation. What's that? What do you call it? The Halimatoto. He is a thunder man. You will hear him if there is an initiation. They ask Bear to sing another dance song. They ask it, all right.
There's uh, 94 programs like that. It just goes on day by day. Um, there are more tapes, um, and I'll be available perhaps for a while in the morning if people want to learn a little more, talk some about it. Um, I'd like to just close by saying it's uh, you, you can't know how much of a thrill it is for me to bring some of this information up here. And uh, I hope it's useful to you and you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, it's working. Um, the next uh, presentation or performance will be by uh, a woman named uh, Nora Downhauer, who's been working with uh, the Thlinket language uh, all her life, I guess. But she's been working with uh, Thlinket literacy, uh, getting it in written form for about the last 10 years, I guess. And uh, she uh, recorded uh, this uh, translation of the speech uh, originally in 1968. And uh, well, she could tell you the rest uh, of the information about it. Nora Downhauer. Thank you, Andy. Good evening, friends. Um, I have along with me my assistant. Um, before I begin, I want to tell you about uh, the speech. I am going to read a speech. It was originally read at a potlatch given for the year-long dead of a relative. And the speech was composed or created to remove grief. As I begin, uh, you all probably notice, I don't say what I'm really saying. I don't really come out and say what I mean or the person who created the speech doesn't really say what is meant. That's because the speech is loaded with metaphors and similes. She begins by saying, does it take pity on us that it is death? Here's the speech. Does it take pity on us, my brother's children, oh, uh. my fathers, all my fathers? Does it take pity on us, this thing that happens? Hey, uh. That is why you hear their voices in this way, these fathers of yours. Lest it fall without honor, that which flowed from your faces, for this they have come out. These fathers of yours, they have come out. They are still present. This is how I feel about them. My grandfathers. Here someone stands in one of them. This mountain tribe's dog. It is as if the dog is barking, guarding your pain. It is what I'm thinking. My father's brother's children, my father's sisters. Yes, here is one standing on the end, raven went down to the bottom of the kelp. He is the one standing on the side from the end. Her blanket, that is the one on this side. That is the one standing next. There is the beaver blanket from Chilcat. Chilcat rope, Nahin. Tlutak, your father. That was one of his blankets, one his rope. At your presence, he has come out, yes. And now they are showing their faces. That is the way they look to me. Your father's sisters, my mother, Sayinaad, her blanket, the turn blanket, the person who is feeling like you, with that person they would go to by canoe to the face of the point of land, Tokanaha. Then it is said his name would be called out. This person who is feeling sorrow. Yes, your father, Sheikh Dutkhed. My grandfather's son, Kuwunagaz. My brother's daughter's son, Kidya Nai. My father's sister's son, Kuhkenat. How very much your sorrow 
that for your sorrow they show their faces, your father's sisters, my brother's son, Katush tu, Kaksak ah, yes, my brother's wife, Ankaksha was tan. How very much they show their faces now. This is how I'm thinking of them. Your sisters in law, yes, they have shown their faces. Wahe, his shirt. It is only now we have finished the rites for him. That is the one there. The raven shirt. It was also him you listened to. Wehe, my brother. This Yerko Wakan, it will lie in his hands. This Wehe's shirt. It is as if he will come out for you to see. Uh, How much pride he also used to feel. Your brother in law. Uh, the raven nest blanket. Here she comes, in which your father's sister, the one on the other side. Your father's sister. Yes, it is long since that we gave up their return. Uh -huh. These sisters of your fathers, your fathers, raven who went down to the bottom of the sea, your fathers, Kadek, his shirt, that is the one, that is the your one. Father's children are listening to. I do not feel that it has burned. It is the same one. He stands in it before you, your father's brother. That is why my father's brother, Gusatan, oh, well. it is as if I will have named all of you, those who are my sisters-in-law, my brother's children. Will I be able to resolve it? Will I be able to resolve it? These turns I have not yet explained. Yes, these turns. Out over him, the person who is feeling sorrow, they would fly your father's sisters. Oh, uh, From there over the person who is feeling like you, they would let fall like down your children, their your feathers. Your children are listening to you. From then on, he would not feel their pain. And from now on, it is as if they have flown back to their nests with your sorrow. This is how I feel about them. Your father's sisters, here someone stands, here, my brother, his hat. Yes, he went by canoe to the mouth of Taku for that hat, to be among his grandfathers, to be among his grandfathers. Yes, from there the frog hat comes to be his. Beside it has come from where he has hands the shirt. Yes, it has also come to be here from Taku. That is why I am saying. Thank you. They're standing before you with them. Yes, during the warm season, he would come out, this father of yours. And now it seems as if he has come out for your sorrows, this father of yours, his hat. Yes, your grandfather. And with it, with your sorrow, he will burrow back down. Your with brother's it. children are listening to you. Yes, he will burrow back down. Not that this will heal you, my brother's children, my father's, my sisters-in-law, my father's sisters. And now, it's as if they are imitating them. Lest the things your grandfathers used to say will wander aimlessly. That is why it is as if they are striving with them. These fathers of yours, here is one, here is one, here someone stands with one with my grandfather. Yukus Kukek, his hat. He has also stood up to face you. Yes, your father, his hat. Kuwanagas, he has stood up to face you. Yes, spirit of the loon. And now, yes, a while back, my brother explained it. Yes, how when the tree is carried by the waves, when it floats to the beach, the sun would lay its feet upon it. Yes, and draw the sorrow out. Now that he has shown his face, this sun, my grandfather's mask, yeah. now uh -huh. let it be as if it's drawn out your sorrow. Gonna the see. small mountain headdress. From within, they show their faces. Your father's sisters, from within mountain pass, yes, that is it now. That is it now. That headdress. 
my grandfather's headdress. The composer of this speech uh, is here, and I wanted her to hear it. It's Mrs. Dalton over here. Thank you. Next uh, will be uh, Tom Lowenstein of Fairbanks. As you can hear from my accent. Um, I'd like to read a few poems. This one's a, an overture, it's called Returns. Ask questions in tunnels of slate, granite, dusty wires where a dead spider swings. Ask in sidings the scarlet challenge of signals, the, 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 weg, the wagon's belly of wet sand. Ask questions of factory windows that grind up a train with glass teeth as it passes. Question the suburbs, the birch trees, poplars, cherries, convertibles that tour the almond gardens. Measure the temperature of the chimneys that take the pulse of fences that run backwards. At all the stops, Ignore a gloved couple waving spiders, signals, poplars, chimneys of blue hair at the passengers on their return journey. This is a poem which um, contrasts with the one I just read. It's um, whereas the first one is a sort of um, the fantasy on uh, modern conveyances. Uh, this is a, a fantasy based on a picture by the Japanese um, woodcut artist Utamaro. And it's called A Picture of Fair Sojourners at the Inn. And it, it depicts um, three very beautiful Japanese women, um, either um, dressing or undressing, it's not clear, um, in a kind of tabernacle in 17th or 18th cent 17th century Japan on uh, some stop in, um, alongside uh, in an inn on a journey. The poem concentrates on one of these figures. She rises in a still column of gray silk from the wash of heaped materials, sashing her middle with a loose complication of orange spider patterned brocade. One scalloped foot surfaces from a wavelet of the kimono. The other, creamy ankle exposed, seems only to have stepped from the silk on condition that this be her final exertion. In all this liquid tumult, her person is rinsed away from the design. The ample face, a mere loop of white paper. The flushed lip parted like a delicate mollusk, and the long black flower seed eyes provide her only emphasis. Uh, it's become um, clear to me in a um, rather, maybe rather a muddied sort of way, that um, the poems which I write um, seem to emerge when um, a sort of schizophrenic process takes place uh, inside me. Um, and, um, well, maybe it's an integrative process in that um, I am in another place um, while I'm writing the poem. The poem seems to uh, take root in, um, in a very um, special uh, locus. Um, and uh, whereas the one I just read um, sort of derived from a taste of Japan in, in, in my mouth, uh, this, this one 
um, has the taste of, of Crete uh, in uh, the Greek island in it. And I found myself, um, as it were, um, not only in Crete uh, while I was writing this poem, but um, uh, many centuries back in Crete um, in a mythological um, time. And um, it's rather an obscure poem uh, which has as its um, background the, the myth of uh, Daedalus and, um, and Pasiphae and Minos. Um, uh, uh, Pasiphae having um, committed adultery with, with a bull and given birth to the Minotaur and Daedalus, the uh, master craftsman, uh, building the, the labyrinth to, um, to keep the dinosaur in and, and, and feeding the dinosaur with um, um, uh, Daedalus and Icarus. Uh, to uh, punish them for helping Pasiphae consummate her uh, revolting um, and depraved uh, uh, um, uh, passion. It's called Pasiphae. The horns of Minos, glowing bar relief, the jealousy, panic in vestibules. Quaking from the cornered walls, the monster's halitosis gags the court. From apiary and labyrinth, shat out swan feathers, handfuls of wax. In their wings, the Cretan breeze. Below, the filthy breathing in the ditch. Too close, the buzz of the sun. Wax drains through the quills. Briefly nesting on the waves, he gargles the Icarian maze. The cliffs recede. The queen starves for her meat. The architect continues to migrate. I'm just going to read um, two more, which I wrote in Alaska. Um, and they, um, they both concern um, another mythical figure, uh, this one of my own construction. Um, I use the word construction rather than creation because she's, um, uh, she's an, a bird and a woman simultaneously. Uh, she's Mrs. Owl. And um, in the first poem, Mrs. Owl and the Field Marshal, uh, she, uh, as well as me, is transported um, into a um, totally alien um, environment, um, where she is this sort of spirit of, of uh, freedom and love, um, if you like, um, of a rather seedy but uh, golden-hearted kind. Uh, she's um, here on the battlefield, or uh, on the fringes of the battlefield um, um, before the beginning of a, um, of a 19th century battle, let's say the Battle of Waterloo. And she's courting the field marshal, um, the English field marshal, of course. And um, she wants to go to bed with him um, before the battle. And um, of course, he, he obliges um, because she's such um, a pathetic, um, but um, at the same time glamorous um, a person and they have this uh, rather a strange affair which um, precedes the battle after which it's suggested that he, he dies. Mrs. Owl and the Field Marshal, a love moment before battle and it's a sort of conversation of star-crossed lovers. Let me just slip a little of my wing beneath your medals said Mrs. Owl. The touch of the blue surge on my feathers and your dangling distinguishments of prowess. Fetch me a condition of light-headedness and ardor that only the most particularly chosen subsequent gestures would be capable of quenching. My belly is full, said the field marshal, of the general's heaviness. 
The open wonder of your sources are, however, a temptation to drink far and deep. I have a tender way with grandees, said Mrs. Owl. And for the gallant military, subdue those inhibitions it is usual for a gentle woman of a firm upbringing to contrive. Then, madam, let me serve you to the best of my abilities, and that speedily, for the field is set, the drum roars, and then glory will spread back round us for the honor of the queen whose feet we throw our fifes and muskets at. But when the powder's burnt, the drum broken, and the flags returned, torn but with glory to the capital. Ah, Mrs. Owl. murmured Mrs. Owl. The delightful percussion of your joints over my fat. There are moments when everything rushes my insides and whole fields of grass desire some impudence with me. Nipping and grinding her breast feathers and urinating a little she rolls his thighs over and over the three eggs. We have had a nice time, said the field marshal. There is a little blood on your eyelashes, murmured Mrs. Owl in a gentle voice. And lastly, the death of Mrs. Owl, which speaks for its, itself, I think, The death of Mrs. Owl. Those of you who who know um, the Arctic uh, will prob will no doubt recognize her deathbed, which is the roof of a hunter's cabin, scattered with the bones and the and the corpses of his catch. Mrs. Owl lay grieving on the flat tarpaulin roof. She propped her tired head on an old weathered piece of whalebone. The dog team rested in a chained line behind the little house and howled in sympathy and hunger as she sorrowed. Alas, she murmured half aloud in the still air. Perhaps I've kept my love eye open for too long. I see my future as I see my past. The dogs will bite my soft heart through and through. This is my death song, said the dying love matron, that I may finish with a pleasant epitaph. Let love and sunrise shut your eye, rain from the half moon sweep the sky. Fear nothing when the eggs shall cry. Death shall not chill them, though I die. But when your life is almost spent, think of the kindness that I meant. Though you will love no more, do not repent. I robbed you of your heart before I went. Uttering these words mournfully, Mrs. Owl sank onto the roof, one wing drooping over the whalebone, the other folded neatly into her stomach. As the wind arrived to sweep away her spirit, for one last moment, Mrs. Owl shook out her feathers in a ruff of love. And with her big eyes still open, staring at the empty sky, she fell asleep. The northeast wind approached a little closer and drifted pleasantly over the tarpaulin lifting the spirit, Mrs. Owl, with gallant ceremony. Out across the water swept the north wind faster, and soon the soul of Mrs. Owl was cooing southward on the Chukchi Sea, across frozen waves towards her sweet peninsula of change. The dog team got up stiffly from its frosty corners and stood stretching, Mrs. Owl's remains 
lay quietly on the tarpaulin, her snow-white feathers lifting pleasantly under the morning wind. 